you. Thank you. Well, it's a really great honor to be here and to be back in New York. We're on a 100-city tour for the 20th anniversary of Democracy Now! And I also want to... Um, a shout out to my colleagues, Nermeen Sheikh and Dina Guzder and Erin Dooley over there in the back and the volunteers and the interns who are help, helping out. Democracy Now! is a joint effort, a joint project, a brain trust of a remarkable group of reporters and producers and videographers for the last 20 years. We never thought it was going to go beyond nine months. It was the only daily election show in public broadcasting in 1996. I got the call to do the show when I was in a safe house in Haiti and covering that critical time right after the first coup against Jean-Bertrand Aristide. People would, who announced for office could be gunned down. People who would go to the polls could be gunned down. And still the overwhelming number of people voted. But in our country, when I was asked to do a daily election show sitting there from that vantage point, most people just didn't vote facing nothing like the adversity that they faced in Haiti, but most people didn't vote. And I thought, well, why do this? Why do this election show? I never thought people in this country were apathetic. What were people doing in their communities? That's what we wanted to find out. And so we used the primary system to go state to state to see how people were engaged. And sure, there are a lot of obstacles that are put in people's paths. I mean, and they've increased over the last 20 years. You've had a brush with the criminal justice system, as millions and millions of people have in this country. In certain states, you might never be able to vote again. In other states, like in Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, New Vermont and Maine, you can vote from jail. Um, if you go to the polls intending to vote, as people did in Arizona, in Phoenix, they found on primary day that 100, 140 of the 200 polls were simply closed. This year, in 2016, 140 of the 200 polls. Could it have anything to do with the growing Latino population in Phoenix? What did the authorities say? They said they thought they'd save some money. But, well, you know, by that rationale, why open any poll at all? Think of all you could save. But, of course, to say the least, this is an enormous threat to democracy, the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act. So we've been going across this country, speaking with people all over, and one of the first places we went was the birthplace of Pacifica Radio, celebrating 67 years of Pacifica, KPFA in Berkeley. Um, you know, you know Pacifica's history. Born 67 years ago, a man named Lou Hill, a conscientious objector from World War II, came out of the detention camps and said, there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war. And so, run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. Or as the late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at University of Pennsylvania, George Gerbner, would say, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so KPFA went on the air in 49. 1959, KPFK went on the air. Uh, we were just in Los Angeles celebrating KPFK, and just as we were getting ready for the talk, I got a text on my phone, and it said, Juan Carlos and Sharina have been arrested. Juan Carlos Davila, I think he's, oh, there he is. Okay, there he is with his camera, just actually doing that, but on the streets of New York with Sharina, our videographers at Democracy Now!, um, where were they? Well, that was the night there was that anti-Trump rally in New York, and a thousand people came out. Um, and, you know, they filled the streets of Midtown Manhattan, and Trina and Juan Carlos were on a little bridge next to Grand Central. I didn't even know it existed, the Grand Central Bridge. And protesters were there, too. They were filming everyone, and the police came up. And actually, as the police moved in on Juan Carlos and Trina, the reporters, um, a commanding officer said, no, they have the right to film. The problem was the officer left. And then they moved in on them, and they pushed Juan Carlos's face into the dirt. They confiscated their equipment. Um, 
and they were arrested. So as I'm walking up on the stage at KPFK in Los Angeles, I'm getting a text, they've been arrested. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? So um, I text Juan Carlos, I well, go to the source. Are you okay? Yes. Uh, are you arrested? Yes. He didn't even have any misspellings. I said, are you in a police van? Yes. Are you handcuffed? Yes. Um, are your hands handcuffed behind your back? Yes. So how are you writing? Yes. So, um, you know, everyone sprung into action. I called Juan Gonzalez, co-host on Democracy Now. He called the police. I called the police. We don't spend much time calling the police, but on this day, it was critical since they were in their custody. Uh, Sam Alkoff, our video producer, raced down to police plaza, and after hours, they were released. But we should not have to get a record when we put things on the record. It is... It's absolutely critical. You know, there's a reason why our profession, journalism, is the only one explicitly protected by the Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. And this is a very serious obligation that we have to go to where the silence is. So the second Pacifica station, KPFK in Los Angeles, and then, of course, here in New York, WBAI 99.5 FM went on the air in 1960, contribute early and often, and yes, it's in another fundraising drive. Now, in the first years of operation, um, they were broadcasting a debate between the great writer James Baldwin and Malcolm X over the effectiveness of nonviolent civil disobedience, the effectiveness of the lunch counter sit-ins in the South. And then there's KPFT in Houston, went on the air in 70, and WPFW in Washington went on the air in 1977. That is the fabulous five. That is the Pacifica Radio Network in the United States. KPFT in Houston is the only radio station in the country that was blown up. In the first weeks that it went on the air, the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens, right in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant. And I thought that was a good song. But anyway, uh, they go on the air, they rebuild, the transmitter goes up again, um, and the Klan straps 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blows it up again. So now it'll take months. January 71, they finally get ready. Um, Public broadcasting comes in in its infancy to broadcast this moment when the phoenix rises from the ashes. Arlo Guthrie comes back into the Petro Metro to finish his song live on the air, Alice's Restaurant, and KPFT goes back on the air. I can't remember if it was the Exalted Cyclops or the Grand Dragon, because I often confuse their titles, but he said it was his proudest act. I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it's a Chadian victim of Hussein Habre, one of the leading attorneys taking that dictator to trial is right in the front row, Reed Brody, whether it is an aunt in Afghanistan or an uncle in Iraq, or a kid from the South Bronx or from the South Valley, we were just speaking at RFK High School in Albuquerque, where the overwhelming majority of the kids in that high school are undocumented. When you hear someone speaking from their own experience, it challenges all the stereotypes and caricatures that fuel the hate groups. I mean, you say, it sounds like my bubba or my baby, my aunt, my uncle. I'm not saying you'll agree with them. How often do we even agree with our family members? But it makes it much less likely that you will want to destroy them. It's that understanding that's the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war, which is why we have to take the media back. Now, in these last few weeks, 
we have lost some great prophets and activists, like Michael Ratner. Michael Ratner, who is the late, the late president of the Center for Constitutional Rights. There'll be a big public memorial for Michael at Cooper Union on June 13th. I hope everyone comes out. It would be his 73rd birthday if he had survived. He fought cancer over this last year. I mean, Michael Ratner was the first to sue over the Attica uprising, representing prisoners who were injured or killed. He brought the first suit under the War Powers Act of U.S. troops in El Salvador, and then holding those in power accountable for the Iraq War, uh, suing Donald Rumsfeld and Bush administration officials, making it much more uncomfortable for them, or maybe impossible for them to travel in places like Europe, afraid they might be arrested if they go there. And it was Michael Ratner who brought the suit on behalf of Guantanamo prisoners that they should have habeas corpus rights, be able to have their day in court. Um, we interviewed his close friends, Reed Brody, and as well Michael Smith, attorneys and colleagues on Democracy Now! when um, Michael died. One of the people quoted in the New York Times in his obituary was the attorney David Cole, who said, um, he asked Michael Ratner about the Guantanamo case, and he said, when I asked him years later what he thought his chances were in filing suit, he said, none whatsoever. He said, we filed 100% on principle. David said that could be his epitaph, 100% on principle. But the case did go to the Supreme Court, and he won. And another of the great prophets, Father Dan Berrigan, as 800 people packed into the Xavier Church to remember him just a few weeks ago. Dan Berrigan, the Jesuit priest, who along with his brother Phil Berrigan, well, engaged in that action in 1968, May 17th, that would become known as the Catonsville Nine, when they took the draft files, hundreds of A1 draft files from the draft offices, and they took them outside and burned them with napalm, homemade napalm. Dan did not know if he would be imprisoned for many years for that action. So a week before, when he was in Portland Airport in Maine after giving a talk, we were just there last Saturday, um, he sat down and he wrote a statement that he wanted to release right after the action. He said, our apologies for the fracture of good order, the burning of paper instead of children. He would later say, we have chosen to be powerless criminals in a time of criminal power. We have chosen to be branded as peace criminals by war criminals. Rest in peace, Father Dan. Rest in peace, Michael Ratner, just as you lived. And I think as is evidenced here tonight, that struggle that you engaged in is sure to be carried on. Now, that story I just told you about the Ku Klux Klan, you know, at KPFT, you know, 46 years ago, is a story about history. I can't believe we're talking about the Ku Klux Klan today. I can't believe we're talking about the Ku Klux Klan in the 2016 presidential election. How is it possible that the presumptive nominee of a major political party, right, Donald Trump, the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party, when asked on CNN whether he would disavow support of an avowed white supremacist, David Duke, I can't remember if he was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, but whether he would disavow his support, his support of Duke and the Klan, he waffled. 
He said he had to consider this more deeply. When was the last time you heard Donald Trump say he had to consider anything more deeply before he commented? But on this issue, he had to weigh it. What exactly did he had to delve more deeply into? Which clan chapter it was? He wouldn't want to generalize to all the clan chapters of the United States. I mean, this is frightening because you're talking about the possible president of the United States. You're talking about a president who polls are indicating has a very good chance, possibly, of becoming the president of the United States. A man who's ripped open the underbelly of hate in America, opening this Pandora's box. And it's not just his comments on the Klan, right? Look at the rallies. For example, the supporter, John McGraw, who sucker punched a Black Lives Matter activist in North Carolina and then said that next time he would kill him. And Donald Trump saying that he would pay the legal fees of these supporters if they're jailed. Uh, the only silver lining here is I heard Stephen Brill, the legal publisher and writer, say it was interesting to hear him say pay their legal fees because he never pays his own. But anyway, um, uh, Donald Trump, violence at the rallies. And then a very interesting piece that David Korn did in Mother Jones about Trump's longtime butler, who Trump didn't want to let go of. He worked for him for like 70 years, was with the family for decades. You know, the story of Trump's father, Fred Trump, who the New York Times wrote about his name and his address in 1927 or 28, part of a Klan rally in Queens. And now his longtime butler, Anthony Senecal, that the New York Times did a piece on last March 15th, a not unfavorable piece, how he was so deeply close to the family. And then David Korn read it and went looking around about this guy, Anthony Senecal, who worked for Donald Trump for 17 years. Uh, Trump didn't want to let go of him when he wanted to retire, so he made him the in-house historian of Mar-a-Lago in Florida, and he would uh, give tours. What was he saying on Facebook for years? Yes, in 2009, Senecal told Trump if he was going to resign. Trump asked him not to. Meanwhile, on Facebook just this year, oh, what did he say? Hmm. He talked about President Obama saying, this character who I refer to as Zero, he continually refers to him as Zero on, on Facebook, should have been taken out by our military and shot as an enemy agent in his first term. Instead, he still remains in office doing everything he can to gut the America we all know and love. He goes on to say, Asked why he posted messages calling for Obama to be killed, Senecal says, I cannot stand the bastard. I don't believe he's an American citizen. I think he's a fraudulent piece of crap that was brought in by the Democrats. Uh, yes, Trump's historian is a birther. He notes that he's been suspended in the past on Facebook for publishing material that violated uh, Facebook's guidelines. Um, yeah, well, his, it's not only his butler was a birther, Donald Trump himself, of course, was one of the leaders of the birther movement. N nothing could be more racist than the birther movement that basically othered President Obama. Whatever you think of him, saying, well, he's not like us. He couldn't be from this country. This racist backlash against the first African-American president in a land with a legacy of slavery. And one of the things he, the butler continually posted on Facebook was the Confederate flag over and over. You know, Donald Trump announced for the presidency last June 16th. You remember what happened June 17th in Charleston, South Carolina. That was the day of the horror when nine people, eight parishioners and their beloved pastor, Clemente Pinckney, were gunned down 
by a white supremacist. He came to join them in Bible study, this young white man. They all knew each other, didn't know him, but welcomed him anyway. And at the end of an hour, he blew them away, except for one woman. He told her he wanted her to bear witness to tell the world what he had done. A few days later, the survivors and the loved ones of the victims put this country to shame when they said they forgave him. I'd like to say that Dylan Storm Roof unwittingly blew the roof off of the Confederacy, but I don't know if that's true right now, given what is playing out in this presidential election year. But a few days later, when Clemente Pinckney lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda in Columbia, South Carolina, right? He was a longtime state senator as well as pastor at the Mother Emanuel Church. Thousands streamed by to pay their respects. But first they had to stream by the Confederate flag flying at full mast on the Capitol grounds. All the flags of South Carolina at half mast, except for one because the Confederate flag could not fly at half mast. It had been put up on top of the Capitol in, in 1960s in response to the civil rights movement. And then in 2000, because of pressure from some sports franchises in the NAACP, they took it off the Capitol, Capitol and put it on the grounds on the condition that anyone who defaced it or pulled it down would face greater fine and it could not fly at half mast. And I think, you know, after this killing, and after the mass funeral that took place at the College of Charleston Arena, where thousands came to pay their respects, President Obama sang Amazing Grace, if you ask people who took down that flag, I think most people in this country would probably say the South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley. But that's not who took down that flag. And this is where movements come in. And we need a media that covers movements. It was 5.30 in the morning on June 27, 2015, 10 days after the massacre at the Emanuel AME Church. The South Carolina State House glowed in the morning light. Bree Newsom, a 30-year-old African-American woman from Charlotte, North Carolina, walked toward the main entrance of the building. She was accompanied by Jimmy Tyson, a young white man from North Carolina, and others who scouted the grounds. They observed the scene around the State House, waiting until there were no guards visible. After about 30 minutes, Tyson and Newsom made their move. They walked swiftly toward the Confederate monument, which stands directly in front of the main steps. The tall monument, topped with a heroic image of a Confederate soldier, pays tribute to those who have glorified a fallen cause, slavery. The two activists proceeded to the 30-foot high flagpole that stood directly behind the monument. The Confederate battle flag flapped lazily at the top. And then Bree donned her climbing gear that she had learned how to use a few days before. And she quickly ascended the pole. Guards noticed and began shouting at her to come down. Reaching the top of the flagpole, she grabbed the Confederate flag and unhooked it. She said, you come against me with hatred and oppression and violence. I come against you in the name of God. As she clutched the symbol of the Confederacy, she said, this flag comes down today. She lowered herself slowly along with the flag. As soon as she reached the ground, Bree and Jimmy were arrested. Video of the protests went viral, was seen around the world. Her bail fund quickly raised more than $125,000. Ava DuVernay, director of the Oscar-nominated film Selma, was among the many to hail her, tweeting, I hope I get the call to direct the motion picture about a black superhero I admire. Her name is Bree Newsom. But within about an hour, Two state house workers raised a new Confederate flag on the Capitol grounds. This is astounding. It's the day after the joint funeral. Thousands of people packed into the Charleston arena. The next day, the day that Bree took down this flag, the individual funerals were taking place. And so as the victims were lowered into the ground, the Confederate flag, was raised by the state once again. We raced from Charleston to the jailhouse where Bree and Jimmy were and somehow got into the arraignment cell. 
They were charged with defacing state property, facing a penalty of up to three years in prison and a $5,000 fine. Then we raced to the lobby where people were gathering to greet them if they got out. And I talked to a woman named Tamika Lewis who'd come with Bree from North Carolina, from Charleston, from Charlotte. And she said to see that flag actually come down and all the things it represents being taken down by a strong black woman was one of the greatest symbolic images one person could ever witness. And another young black woman named Carol Parker came from Columbia. She had no idea who Bree was. She just knew she'd grown up in Columbia and passed the Confederate flag every day of her life, denigrated and humiliated. And she said, Bree has done what our governor hasn't had the courage to do, what our General Assembly hasn't had the courage to do. She went up there and did what had to be done when it needed to be done. Yes, shout it from the rooftops. It was Bree Newsom who took down the symbol of the Confederacy in South Carolina. Now, as I wrap up, it's absolutely critical that we have a media that covers movements, the movements that don't hit the corporate media radar screen. This year with Bernie Sanders, he hasn't created a movement. He is riding a movement that's been growing for years. As so many said in 2011, after the Occupy encampments were eviscerated by the police, you know, what did that movement amount to? It was destroyed. It didn't amount to a hill of beans. I'm sorry, obviously, this is not the case. Right, the thousands who streamed into Zuccotti Park, the media for the first week didn't cover them at all, at all. You know, there's something worse than negative coverage. It's the vanishing. And that's what was happening. The media moguls in their limousines passing by, the elite journalists. This is the media metropolis of the world. Just didn't cover it. And then I remember Erin Burnett, who started her show out front right about that time on CNN. Her first piece was called Seriously? On Occupy. Right? This is how the media mock them when they finally cover them. They said, I mean, what do these people represent? They can't even settle on an issue. They're against the death penalty. They're against war. They're against racism. They're against inequality. They're concerned about climate change. I thought, oh my God, they're listening. Yes, all of those issues together. And they would say, you know, they can't even decide on a spokesperson. But it's a leaderful movement, not a leaderless movement. Occupy occupied the language. Now, if you say 1% or the 99%, everyone knows what you're talking about, right? You change the language, you change the world. So many... And I want to move from Occupy to the issue of climate change, where I'll end. But that year, 2011, was astounding. From the Arab Spring, which I think partly inspired the uprising in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, right, the home of AFSCME, but also the home of the John Birch Society. You know, the John Birch Society, that racist, segregationist, anti-civil rights, anti-King organization that was co-founded by Fred Koch. That's right, the father of the oil barons, James and, uh, oil barons Charles and David Koch. And then you move from the Wisconsin uprising to the protests against the Keystone XL in the summer of 2011, then Occupy, then the UN Climate Summit. And anyone who watches or listens to Democracy Now!, you know we cover every climate summit, from Copenhagen to Cancun, from Durban to Doha, from Poland to Peru to Paris. And you might say, given what happens inside these summits, why waste the fuel? Because it's not what happens inside. It's what happens outside. The thousands of people who come from the most threatened parts of the planet, who come to these summits to say, like the 15-year-old boy from the Maldives, my country will be submerged. Like the people of sub-Saharan Africa who say, they are cooking, you are cooking our continent. Turning to the historically greatest greenhouse gas emitter of all, the United States, demanding we change. They have debates in the rest of the world. Those debates are around what to do about climate change. Our debates in this country, in the media, are 
whether human beings have anything to do with climate change. I mean, the science is settled it's as if every time we talked about the planet Earth, we brought on someone from the Flat Earth Society for balance. But something unusual happened in Durban, South Africa in 2011, when the outside was invited in because of pressure from the outside. The youth were invited to address the world body. And this is where I want to end, with Angelia Pottery. She was a student here in the United States from College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, where we just spoke last Sunday. Angelia Pottery, where you get a degree in human ecology, seeing all of these issues as connected. Hundreds of youth came into the world body and they surrounded the delegates, the world leaders, the bureaucrats, the scientists. And Anjali ascended the stage and said, I speak for more than half the world's population. We are the silent majority. You've given us a seat in this hall, but our interests are not on the table. What does it take to get a stake in this game? Lobbyists, corporate influence, money? You've been negotiating all of my life. You've failed to meet pledges. You've missed targets. You've broken promises, but you've heard this all before. She said, we're in Africa, home to communities on the front line of climate change. The science tells us we have five years max. You're saying, give us 10. The starkest betrayal of your generation's responsibility to ours is that you call this ambition. Where is the courage in these rooms? Now is not the time for incremental action. In the long run, these will be seen as the defining moments of an era in which narrow self-interest prevailed over science, reason, and common compassion. She said, long-term thinking is not radical. What's radical is to completely alter the planet's climate, to betray the future of my generation, and to condemn millions to death by climate change. What's radical is to write off the fact that change is within our reach. 2011 was the year in which the silent majority found their voice, the year when the bottom shook the top. 2011 was the year when the radical became reality. And then she quoted President Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And she looked out on the vast vista of faces and said, so distinguished delegates and governments around the world, governments of the developed world, deep cuts now, get it done. And democracy now was there. The only national broadcast from this country to be broadcasting every day, the voices inside and out, and then broadcasting them throughout the world. Yes, we need a media like WBAI in New York, like Democracy Now!, like community television in New York, and independent media all over this country and around the world to link together, to break through the static, that veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality, when what we need is the media to give us the dictionary definition of static, criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. Democracy now.